Hey everyone, thanks for joining us at the Progressive Forum, the world's only expressly progressive lecture series. We're based in Houston, Texas. I'm Randa Morton, founder of the Forum. We're excited to present Heather Cox Richardson, acclaimed American historian and author of Democracy Awakening, Notes on the State of America. I'm grateful to our generous sponsor, the Beverly M. Manny Trust. The trustee is Neil Manny. This live stream is a recorded version of our in-person event in Houston on October the 19th, 2023. The free recording will remain on our website. To purchase Democracy Awakening at a discount, Click the link under the screen and our wonderful partners at Blue Willow Bookshop will send you a copy. And please consider a voluntary donation to the Progressive Forum by clicking the donation link to keep these free educational live streams available worldwide. Heather Cox Richardson is a professor at Boston College and her daily newsletter, Letters from an American, is followed by over two million avid readers. I give you Heather Cox Richardson. Welcome to Texas. We are <laughs> I'm so thrilled to be here. I love this state. And congratulations, number four debuted. I saw you proudly hold up your book. Congratulations. We're excited yeah, that for was, you. That was lovely, and it was thanks to you all. So I appreciate that. That was he's referring to the the um, the New York Times bestseller list. But you do have a special relationship with your fans and some specific dynamics with them. Yeah, we're all in this together, right? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm here because of you all. Um, I feel like I'm about to have an exam. I, I, I couldn't hear what he was saying back there when he was talking back there, so if this is like a, we're reliving my comps, um, I hope somebody will let me know. Um, well, how did you come to write the book and the way you set it up? To, to, so I came, actually, that's a great place to start because I started to write this book really to answer the questions that everybody asks me every day. You know, uh, what is the Southern strategy? How do the parties switch sides? What is a liberal? Do we live in a democracy or a republic? And, uh, but what I realized that people ask me most of all is how did we get here? Where are we? And how do we get out? So I sat down to write a number of short essays. The book is 30 essays that I hope stand alone, but that they also tell a larger story. And I wrote them all, and I was under a lot of time pressure because I was writing. All of a sudden, I sound like God, don't I? I got a lot louder. Um, because I was writing the book during the day, and then I was writing the letters at night. And I wanted to make sure the book came out before the election. So I wrote the chapters, but I didn't reread them. I would finish a chapter, and I would throw it into a file, and I would deliberately not go back to it. So when I picked the, then I took a, I finished the manuscript, I took a, a few months off. That's when Buddy and I got married, actually. I took a few months off, and then when I went back and reread the manuscript, I discovered it was a completely different book than I thought I had written. Because what it said was that, it, it, to me what it said is that while I had been writing it, other people's voices had been in it. That is, the questions that everybody was asking me were actually asking a different set of questions than what I recognized that I was answering. So when I reread the manuscript, what jumped out to me was that it was a story not just about how do we get here and how do we get out. It was a story about the way that authoritarians can overthrow democracies through the way they use language and history. And once I realized that, once I saw that, I threw out that original manuscript and I rewrote about 80% of it. 
And what emerged is this book here, which is an answer to all the questions that people ask, I hope, but also a much larger discussion of how people come to the point that they will vote away a democracy and replace it with authoritarianism. So it is a conversation, I think, between my readers and me. But when I dedicated the book to my readers, I wasn't being cute. I really felt that when the, the essays sat by themselves, it really was almost as if they were talking to themselves without me there. The same, way, the same thing that happens in a classroom. If you turn good students loose with material, what comes out is not at all what you thought was going to. And that's kind of what the book felt like. And so it really does belong to the readers at least as much as it belongs to me. Uh, you have said while you were writing the book, you came to a shocking realization you didn't realize how close we came to losing our democracy. Uh, could you tell us about that? So if any of you have already read the book, you will know it's divided in three sections. And the first is how we got here, and the third is how we get out, which are both fine. But then there's that middle section about where are we. It's really scary. And I found that when I was writing that, the first, the first incarnation, you know, I read a gazillion drafts, and the first incarnation, I kind of thought I was keeping the record for those years. And so I fantasized that each essay was going to be three single-spaced pages in Google Docs, which is where I work. So three and a quarter pages was what I was aiming for. And the first chapter on Russia, Russia, Russia was 27 single-spaced pages. <laughs> And I was like, oh man, I have such a problem. So what I realized was I wasn't keeping, I wasn't recording the record, I've done that. I was trying to give the contours. So I stripped out all the noise. And when you strip out the noise for the years from 2015 to the present, you know, she got fired. She, he wrote a letter that was, ang that was angry. Oh, this happened over here in Georgia. When you strip out the noise, what you see is the classic steps of the rise of an authoritarian. And even me living through it as closely as I did every day, I don't think I really understood how close we came. And when you look back, and everybody who reads the book is like, oh my heavens, that second section is terrifying. And I'm with you. I actually, when I went to read the, one of the last drafts, I was reading through the second section, and I thought, oh, come on, it can't have been that bad. I must, be, I must be exaggerating. So I actually went through and I rechecked all my footnotes. And then I rechecked it against the letters. And then the letters from an American I write every night. And, and I was like, I'm not exaggerating. This really happened. But, you, but you'll be shocked if you make it through that section at how much of it you've forgotten at, and, or that you didn't really understand at the time. At least I found that. And I found it surprisingly frightening. I'm not sure I've made it through the second section myself yet in one sitting. Well, was there uh, something in particular, a moment or an example, where you felt we were perilously close to the edge? There are a lot of them, actually, when you, because there's a number of steps in authoritarianism, and we really did them pretty classically. Um, the, the ones that jump out, of course, are the obvious ones. The Unite the Right rally in um, Charlottesville, Virginia, where the former president actually declared himself on the side of the militias, which in the United States means something different than it might mean in other countries, which I don't have the, the qualifications to talk about. But when people think about the rise of fascism, for example, they tend to think of it as an ideological movement that spreads into the streets. But in the United States, we have classically done it the other way around. We've had gangs on the streets who make connections between each other and start to fight, th fight for something together. And from that, it is easier to radicalize them because they have already made an, an organization. So for all that that moment was important for the former president, it was very important for the organization of those, those gangs that we've always had in our society, but those gangs to have a leader from within the administration. So that was one. Um, the, uh, the, the day after the first acquittal from the first impeachment, um, Trump announced that he was going to uh, take revenge, and he did. I mean, there's another place where when you stripped out the noise, it's like, wow, all the inspector generals, whoop, they're gone. And 
you know, they, it was a day by day basis, and you were like, oh, there goes another inspector general. Oh, there goes another inspector general. But when you put them all together and you recognize we lost almost all of our inspectors general in, in the space of a very small amount of time, then, of course, the, um, the, uh, the spring of 2020, when the coronavirus shuts down the country and Trump is terrified that he's going to lose re-election because he was planning to run on the economy and the economy didn't exist at that point, if you recall. And he instantly, I was shocked at how soon he starts to say, I think it's in April, he's, we shut down in mid-March. By April, I think he, it is, he says, I'm the president and I have the authority to do anything I want. And then, um, and then June, of course, June 1st with, I'm sorry, you asked for one or two and I'm giving you the no. entire. <laughs> Beautiful, but, go ahead. But, but June 1st when, uh, when he walked across Lafayette Square and, um, and that was obviously a dramatic show of force. And that's a great example of a place where the noise stripped away just how bad it was because we tended to focus on the fact he'd hidden in the bunker the day before or whatever it mm. was. I can't remember off the top of my head. You strip that away and you see an authoritarian really trying to reinforce his power with the military, which is why when the military backed away over the next couple of days, not just joint, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley from the Army, but also all across the rest of the branches, they were like, no, 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 we don't declare our loyalties to a person, it's to the Constitution. And then, of course, the attack on Gretchen Whitmer in, uh, was in uh, Michigan, which made it clear that there was an attempt to, to tear down governments, and then, of course, um, you know, January 6th. That's a lot for four years. You wonder why you're tired? Um, in another interview, you, you really drew out the uh, General Milley's comment afterwards and the leaders of the military, and this was just crucial, according to something you said to Vanity Fair. Can you, can you uh, focus on that for a minute? Yes, so the U.S. military has a very strong tradition of its own. It's been around for a long time, and it has very strong guardrails for really, really interesting historical and psychological reasons that I won't go into now, but I would dearly love to, because it's really interesting. I won't, but, um, <laughs> but the one exception to that is Homeland Security, by the way. They are new, and they do not have those traditions. So one of the things the military has always done is very aggressively stayed out of politics. That is part of their tradition, and there are very strong reasons that they do that. And Millie, I remember seeing Millie that day walking across Lafayette Square in his battle fatigues and me thinking, oh boy, we're in trouble, because that line has been crossed. And, and I was not aware at the time that Millie peeled off. He didn't realize what was going to happen, and he and, and Esper peeled off. But the day after that, he writes a letter saying, I did not intend to do that. That was a huge mistake. And then three days later, he gives a speech at a graduation that is all about how the military must not do that, must not get involved. And there's all kinds of op-eds everywhere where people are from the military are saying, that is not us. And then the Navy gets involved and the Air Force. And you know, each branch, huge numbers of people wrote letters saying, this is not what the American military is about. And that was really important, not only because there were so many members of the military who had been involved in right-wing um, uh, organizations, uh, although 40% of our military are people of color. So that's a, there's a tension in that when people talk about the military as being you know, all part of one group or all part of another. It's important to remember that Milley is talking about 40% of his population when he says it's really important that we care, for example, about race issues in the military. Um, or when he did, he's no longer the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But, um, but when the military took that stand, it was a really huge deal, not only because it reinforced these traditions, but also because it said to Trump and his supporters, you do not have the military behind you. So you're not going to be able to turn this into a military coup. And that was a, a neon sign across the heavens that he was not going to be able 
to use the military the way that other military coups were able to do. And that's the point when he starts to use the, the armed forces that are within Homeland Security, because there's actually a lot of police forces we have, for example, in different parts of what are now Homeland Security that are under, operate under different rubrics. And some of them are in very funny places, but there are a number of those uh, law enforcement officers there, and that's who he turns to. But they are no match for the U.S. military. So the fact that the U.S. military took that stand changed the trajectory re in really important ways. And right up until January 3rd, another really important event on January 3rd was that all 10 at the time living defense secretaries, we've lost one since, put an op-ed in the Washington Post saying to the military, stay out of politics. And if you don't stay out of politics, we promise you, we will make sure that you, you, are, you are accountable for what you've done. And think about what that means. That means January 3rd, these 10 defense secretaries, who, who are from all parties and obviously from a long period of time, were concerned enough about the role of the military in the, the counting of election, or the counting of the electoral votes on January 6th, that they took the Christmas holiday and the New Year's Eve holiday, and they got together and they managed to write an op-ed that all 10 of them would sign off on. And if you have ever tried to get 10 people to sign off on a document, I remember seeing that document and thinking, oh boy, they're really worried if this is how they spent the holidays. And the fact that they stepped back and, and have reinforced, as Milley did when he resigned, uh, not resigned, stepped down, um, uh, at the end of last month, was a really important defense of democracy. I will say it is important that our military does not have to do that. The fact that they did that is astonishing and incredibly important, but they should never have been put in that position. And that's important to remember, although it's lovely that they do it, that's not their job, and it's, that's our job that they did for us that time, and we should never put them in that position again. But thank God, thank God they did. The cover of your book features a hopeful rising sun. What gives you hope? I'm glad you caught it was a rising sun. Some people are like, look, the sun's setting. I'm like, where do you live? That's not what a <laughs> setting sun looks like. Um, so what gives me hope, there are a number of things that give me hope. One is uh, that we have been in similar situations before and we've come through them, not entirely the same, of course. But what really gives me hope is you, the American people, who I think watched the rise of authoritarianism without recognizing what we were seeing. And now that we recognize it, the number of people who are stepping up to the plate to defend democracy is truly astonishing. And that's why I write every night at ungodly hours, because I feel like we're in this together in this incredibly historic moment, and we have woken up. Democracy Awakening. Your book emphasizes uh, that marginalized people, blacks, browns, immigrants, have been a key driver of our evolving democracy. Is it fair to say our diversity is a superpower? How, how is this working? So what the, the book ultimately argued in the, the last section is for a new definition of American history because, I mean, go big or go home, right? Um, and what it argues is that the reason that America did not fall to fascism or communism in the 1930s, as so many countries did, is because marginalized Americans have always kept front and center the ideals that were embodied in the Declaration of Independence, the ideas of equality before the law and a right to have a say in your government. And because of those marginalized Americans, those principles have always managed to keep a handhold in American society in a way that maybe other countries, about which, as I say, I don't speak, have not been able to do. So, so yes, I think in a way you, you could say that the book argues that our many races and genders and classes and people from all these different places and all these different walks of life have in fact been a sort of inoculation against the idea of losing our democracy. Um, what about an example or two? For example, uh, you cite the NAACP founding in 19, 
09 is a big moment. Yes, yeah, so, so that's the question. Like, how did I get to that, to that argument? And as I say, once I put the book down and picked it back up, the, what emerged was something different than I had expected. And one of the things that really jumped out was how incredibly important the NAACP was. And you all know about the NAACP. Many of you probably know about it well. But what, what really jumped out to me was that when we think, for example, about the civil rights movement of the late 20th century, we tend to focus on individuals on, or on individual events. And when you actually look at those events, you discover, for example, that Emmett Till's funeral and his open casket and everything that happened around Emmett Till, the, the, the kid who was murdered um, when he was 14, um, was the suggestion of the NAACP. Um, the idea of Rosa Parks not sitting, to, you know, not moving to the back of the bus. Rosa Parks worked for the NAACP. And, you know, every place I looked, you know, the, the Isaac Woodard, who becomes a real touch point for the civil rights movement immediately after World War II, his story comes to the attention of the president and of Orson Welles, who features him on his radio program repeatedly, by the NAACP. So, what I figured out was that you really had to figure out what the NAACP was doing. And what they were doing was in 1909, they form, and I love this, they, they officially form on Abraham Lincoln's birthday. They don't really, but they figure they want that date. So they say they form that date. And they are a multiracial, multireligious, multipolitical, um, and multi uh, wealth, uh, multi class organization that is dedicated to making the principles of the Declaration of Independence that Abraham Lincoln defended come to life. Okay, well, that's a great idea. It's 1909. Lynching is at a height. You know, there's the progressive era is underway, but that also means a lot of people can't vote. There's all kinds of stuff going on. So what do they do? Well, one of the people who organizes them is, of course, Ida B. Wells. She's a journalist. But another one is W.B. Du Bois, a sociologist and, a, and, a, and a, just a brilliant writer. He can do anything. He's, he's got the right to do anything in this organization. What does he do? He decides to edit The Crisis, which is their magazine. Why does he want to edit The Crisis? Because he edits this magazine, and every week he puts in front of people what it means to live in a society where you cannot be guaranteed equality before the law. So he, he, in beautiful prose, he writes about lynchings, he writes about discrimination, and he makes people see it. Every time somebody gets lynched, the NAACP hangs a sign out their window. They put it in newspapers. They put it in radio shows. Every time that something happens in, um, in the, the South, one of the, the violent events in the South, they have an NAACP worker out there keeping notes, taking records, talking to people, making sure that people know what's going on. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, when you think about the great heroes that we know about the civil rights movement, John Lewis, for example, or, or I mean, I could just go on forever, you don't hear about the fact that they are responding to or trying to draw attention to what the NAACP is doing, which is to wake people up to what it is like to live in a society in which a very few people call all the shots. And so the NAACP, I think, is a great example for our time to say, you know, I feel sometimes like people are waiting for a hero to arise and, and lead us all to salvation. And the bottom line is the people who were doing that footwork in the NAACP were just people like you and me saying, hey, wait a minute, did you hear what happened in that town over there yesterday? Because we need people to know about that. Could you tell people about that? Or, or maybe put it in a letter to somebody and make sure people know. So that those, those sorts of, and there's a bunch of them I talk about, not just double, the NAACP because that called attention to things, but there are other ways in which people promoted democracy from, from the bottom, if you will, rather than waiting to see somebody come and say something brilliant that we would all be electrified by and go out and save society. And I loved that message. Um, I think I saw that message in, in what was, for me, my favorite chapter. It was called Declaring Independence, where you talk about what was happening in the streets in the years leading up to 1776, the Stamp Act and you know, the shot heard around, it's just the way you knitted them together. Uh, do you have a favorite story you could share from that period? Well, so actually my favorite story about that chapter is, I can't believe I managed that, I pulled that one off. Because that's like a lot of history in, how many pages, like nine pages? 
I can't tell you how many times I had to rewrite that sucker. Um, <laughs> But the, the point of that piece was, again, that so many people, <clears throat> 1776 Project, think that, um, um, <laughs> so many people think that American democracy came, sprang alive from the head of George Washington, right? And the truth was that the colonies, the 13 colonies, and they were not all the colonies, by the way. There were plenty of British colonies that did not join the independence movement. Standing invitation for one of them to do so, and they were just like, thank you, we're good. Um, but the ones who did were bitterly divided amongst themselves. They were made up of people who spoke different languages and had different cultures and had come from different continents and distrusted each other on this continent. And, and the idea that they would go from um, the, the treaty that ended the French and Indian War of 1763, 1763, they're all divided. They all love, the, you know, they love being part of the United Kingdom precisely because there was some order to it. That they went from that to declaring independence by 1776 is mind boggling. I mean, people say to me today, oh, it's going to take us forever to get out of this moment. I'm like, tell that to the revolutionaries. Because in 1763, they were happy, loyal subjects. By 1776, they're declaring independence. So how do they do that? And the story of how they did that is the constant conversation that goes on between people who recognize problems with the, what they consider their rights as Englishmen, and these are going to be white men of property, Englishmen, and those who aren't paying that close attention. And it's not top down, this is what you should think. It's, hey, what do you think about these laws? What are you doing in your town? How are we going to work together so that we make sure we protect our rights? And again, they're not talking about women. They're not talking about indigenous Americans. They're not talking about black Americans. They're really just talking about white men. But they're, con they're having a conversation about what it means to live in a society and who should have rights in a society and what should that mean. And as they do that, and as they have these larger conversations, they come up with an idea. And it's a crazy radical idea in 1776. And that's the idea. And mind you, they only managed to come up with it because they exclude people of color, and they exclude women, and they exclude indigenous Americans. But they come up with the idea that they put into writing that every man is created equal. That's really revolutionary, if you think about it. In a time when people had lived under kings or had lived by, by religions or had lived by traditions or had lived by nation states, all of which defined each other as being better than the other neighbors, the idea that you could say, we're going to create a new kind of government in which everybody is created equal is absolutely revolutionary. And that construction of that idea turns that group, that con that that mongrel group of people who don't even speak the same languages into a group that can go on to win the Revolutionary War. And my favorite story, I guess, aside from the fact that I finally think managed to pull it off, was the fact that at the end of it all, one of the founders writes to another and says, when we talk about the revolution, we're not talking about the war. The war was the aftermath of the revolution. The revolution was in everybody's minds. And I love that idea that all it took was imagination to say, all of us who, who don't get along, don't like each other, come from different continents, don't speak the same language, have different cultures, can come together if only we have the imagination to do that. I would like to hone in on the Declaration of Independence. I was struck by how many times your book returned to it. It has no force of law but yet it's more than a glorious announcement document. It's been a grounding force for change uh, for an evolving constitution. How do, how do you see the Declaration of Independence in this way? So there's an old trope in American history that if you have rights, you rest on the Constitution, and if you want rights, you rest on the Declaration. Because that's exactly right. The Declaration is nothing other than an explanation to the nations of the world why the American rebels were, in fact, acting properly and why they weren't people who simply should be hanged, as they would have been if the revolution failed. And that's, that's I, I always think it's something that, that I like to emphasize to my students, because, of course, the way it turned out, it turned out well for them. 
had it gone a different direction, um, it, it was, they were not lying when they said, if we don't hang together, we shall all hang separately. Signing their names on that document was literally signing their own death warrants if it didn't, if it didn't go the way that they were hoping. And I certainly have my issues with the founders. And if you li ever listen to the podcast Joanne Freeman and I did, there's one in particular that keeps me up at night. But when I think of the courage it took to write your name on that and how easy it would have been not to, and I think about some of the people who represent us today, I feel like we owe the, the founders the recognition that they at least had the courage of their convictions. Um, and now I've totally forgotten what you asked. Yeah. <laughs> All these, all these marginal oh, why did I go back that to you, the, okay. they keep calling on the Declaration of Independence to change the Constitution. Right. So, so the reason that I think the Declaration matters so much and the reason that I, that I talk about it so much is because, you know, it gave a language to people who wanted rights. And we talk about this Declaration, but if you ever do a search, you will find out there are hundreds and hundreds of declarations in this country alone. There are in other countries as well that are based on the Declaration of Independence. Not just Seneca Falls, which is quite obvious, but there's one for labor. There's, there are all, many people have written their own declarations of independence. And I think what it did is it gave a language for marginalized people to argue that they were supporting traditional American values by demanding inclusion in those principles of equality before the law and the right to have a say in their government. And without that language, without the ability to say, as people did from the very beginning, you know, Benjamin Banneker writes to, to um, some founder that we don't care about, Thomas Jefferson or someone, um, <laughs> and says, you know, those principles that you put in the Declaration of Independence are just ducky. I paraphrase, but why not me? I'm as educated as you are. I'm as smart as you are. I'm, I'm you know, contributing all these amazing things to science. Why, why not me? And there's another wonderful moment in that, that chapter about um, Phyllis Wheatley, one of America's first poets, an African-American woman writing to an indigenous minister saying, you know, I love this idea about everybody reaching for freedom, but what about us? We feel the same way because it gave people the language to challenge those traditional roles and those religious roles and uh, the ethnic and the, and the racial roles that had been established by custom. It gave them the language to say, we are traditional Americans. We are claiming traditional American history, and therefore, we deserve inclusion in your democracy, which I think is just a really fascinating and important sleight of hand. Your book emphasizes the power of our nation's origin story, that we're basically pushing two origin stories, one from white oligarchs and another from those standing for equality. What's important to under understand about these dueling origin stories? OK, so I think that what you're getting at is that, that my really simplistic view of the world is that there are essentially two ways to look at human society, or at least American society. There's people who believe that we are all created equal, we should all be treated equally before the law, and we should have a right to have a say in our government. There are other people who believe that people are not naturally created equal, that they are not equal, they should not be treated equally before the law because some people are better than others. And those people who are better than others have a right and maybe a duty to rule the rest of us, the makers and the takers, for example. And that idea that society is better ordered if you make sure that a few people have the wealth and the power and the ability to make the laws and to stand above the law is in constant tension with people who say, no, we should all be created equal. And one of the things that I wanted to emphasize in this book, and that I think you, you pointed to very well there, is that often when people in the United States talk about fascism, they look back to the 1920s and they emphasize the, the principles that were articulated by Benito Mussolini in Italy. Really interesting how he came to the principles of fascism. And of course, those principles that Adolf Hitler picks up and puts into power in Germany. But I think it's important to remember that when people talk about fascism, 
Fascism at its heart says some people are better than others. And, and if some people are better than others, then logically one person's gonna be better than everybody else. But it's important to remember that when Hitler's lawyers were trying to find a legal system to impose in Germany, where they looked for inspiration was to America's Jim Crow and Juan Crow laws and America's indigenous reservations. So the idea that somehow there's something foreign born that occasionally hopped over to America after 1920 just doesn't really fit the fact this is a much longer struggle between these two ways of looking at, at human society. Um, I have a Texas question. Big state. <laughs> to the south. Lots to do with Maine. <laughs> you think I'm kidding, but we're the only two states in the Union that fought a uh, war against a foreign power. Maine fought England. Not for very long, but it did in the Aroostook War, which I'm sure you all remember. Um, <laughs> but I actually had connections to Texas early on because when I was a kid, the Maine fishermen would, uh, in, in the winter, would come down here and they would roughneck on the oil rigs. So, uh, so I, a lot of my friends used to come back and forth between Maine and Texas. Well, I, I didn't I, distract him. I thought I was doing a good job. <laughs> I love the personal stories. You know, when I, I think about Texas, I think about your, your book, How the South Won the Civil War, how white oligarchy, as the nation expanded, set up in new places. Uh, when you look at trends here in Texas, what what stands out for you? You know, what's, what meanings do you derive for the bigger picture? I can only do the bigger picture, except unless you want to talk about the 19th century, which I'm quite happy to do um, at, at quite length. Um, but, uh, but one of the things that, that the roles that Texas has played is one that is not a surprise at all to you, and that is the role of the cowboy in American modern political mythology. And it's important to remember that the cowboy comes from Reconstruction. It's, it is our most enduring symbol of Reconstruction, which I suspect probably just made somebody's head explode. But think about the fact that the cowboy really rises in 1866. It really takes off with um, Charles Goodnight on his second trip out of Texas when he goes, he matches up with Oliver Loving, and this, they go on the, the, the um, Goodnight Loving Trail up to Fort. Sumner, where they sell their cattle to, why is everybody looking blank? Don't you all have to take history class here? <laughs> is this meaning anything to anybody? They, 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 they move the cattle up to Fort Sumner, and you know who they're feeding up there? They're feeding the indigenous um, uh, Navajos who have been moved to that reservation on the long walk of the Navajos in 1864. Um, anyway, boy, that was a rabbit hole. Go ahead. Sorry about that. We love it. Um, I love the history of the cattle industry. But I won't give it all to you now. But I will point out that, that in 1866, they do this. And, and they move the, the cattle to Fort Sumner. And the, the US government pays them in gold, of course, which is what the, the, the specie that they're using at the time. And they bring back to Texas, which at the time is completely devastated by the Civil War, to the point that you know there really isn't law here. There's a reason Juneteenth was here is because nobody was really enforcing the law anywhere. And there was actually, it was so violent here that you basically could hire someone to kill somebody else for about three or four bucks if you even bothered, because you might as well just do it yourself. And, um, and they had a special kind of whiskey here known as rifle whiskey. You can tell I went down a rabbit hole in, when I was writing, not my third book. Um, uh, I was reading all the Texas newspapers from 1865. And um, they call it rifle whiskey because it would kill at 200 paces. Um, <laughs> so. But, um, but so they, he, they bring back to Texas uh, thousands of dollars of gold on the back of a mule. And this is what starts the, the cattle runs out of Texas. But I love that story because um, the mule, they, they tie the money on the back of a mule, and the mule gets washed downstream. And, and they recover it, and they bring the money back to Texas. Everybody's like, oh, this is great. Let's go make a gazillion dollars in the cattle industry. But it was one of those, those moments, first of all, those oh crap moments in history where can you be, imagine being the guy who tied the money on the mule and then didn't watch the mule closely enough so it's floating downstream? And you're thinking, 
oh my God, that's everybody's pay for an entire year floating downstream. And then the other piece of that is, what if they hadn't gotten it back? Like, what if they're all destitute, they're all furious about the fact that, they, that they're broke from having just run those cattle out there, and, and they decide it's not worth doing it. There goes the cattle industry. Anyway, um, but what happens is that 66, and the, the cattle industry is going to develop from 66 to about 87, because there's a terrible winter of 87, and the, it hits the cattle that have been overgrazed on the plains, so they're hungry going into the winter, and the winter uh, is just uh, kills them in huge numbers. Um, and that really turns the cattle uh, rangers into ranchers and in the, in the industry as a whole. But the, uh, the cowboy image of 1866 and 1867 and 1868 and 1869 runs up against the idea that the federal government, which is supporting the rights of black Americans in the American South, is a socialistic government. The idea that the government is protecting formerly enslaved people in the American South costs money because you have to pay the officers of the Freedmen's Bureau and you have to pay rations and, and you're trying to support this population. And former Confederate Democrats insisted that this was a form of socialism. And they started in 1871 using the word socialism and they contrast that with the American cowboy. Cowboys, a third of the cowboys were men of color. They depended on the U.S. government for things like buying their cattle at Fort Sumner but, and elsewhere. They depended on the, the industry, on the federal government to fight indigenous Americans. They depended on the federal government for the railroads that moved the cattle out of the plains. But they insisted in those documents, in the newspapers, that the cowboys were independent of the government. They were white young men who only wanted to work hard and not to be interfered with. And that idea of the cowboy standing against an active government that protected black rights is one that dominated the, the late 19th century. We have Buffalo Bill performing as himself in uh, a Ned Buntline story in 1872. By 1883, he has started Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Very quickly, he is essentially the Beyonce of the late 19th century, <laughs> which I kind of love, because if you listen carefully, you can hear him spinning in his grave. And, um, <laughs> and that becomes, of course, goes to the point where it becomes the very first motion picture with the great train robbery, which if you watch that on YouTube, you will see see, you don't understand what's happening unless you read the, the captions, but it is a set piece from Wild West shows. It's not just Buffalo Bills, there are other Wild West shows as well. So, um, so that image is really important throughout the 19th century. And then when the, the, the planes really go into real trouble in the early 20th century and then after World War I, that image falls off the face of the earth. We get the Marlboro Man, but he is an image of poverty and sorrow, not what he becomes, the guy on the white horse. He dies of lung cancer. That's, I'm not making that up. And he is, his, his spread in life is about how miserable his life is. There are no cowboy movies made during World War II. They're all buddy movies and community movies. And then the cowboy makes a dramatic reappearance in the United States after the Brown versus Board of Education decision of 1954. And that's when we get Bonanza and Rawhide and The Lone Ranger. And I believe there are nine of them at one point on primetime TV. And, and of course, Bonanza is the first television show in color. It goes all the way around the world. And embedded in that image is that idea of standing against this socialistic government that is protecting the rights of people of color. So that image, that cowboy image that is associated with, with Texas especially, um, became so deeply embedded in our American political system during Reconstruction that it was able to reappear in the 1950s and, of course, was a symbol on which Ronald Reagan rose to the White House um, to overturn that government that he said was a form of, of creeping socialism. Well, do you think political leaders were actually deliberately pushing? 100%. The television, okay. TV shows? There's this guy named Barry Goldwater. And, and those of you who don't know to whom I'm referring, Barry Goldwater was an Arizona senator who was actually a trust fund baby, but his grandparents had been immigrants to Arizona uh, before it became a state when it was still a territory. And they were dry goods people, uh, clothing, uh, they were part of a clothing store, and they actually made a ton of money because the federal government was pouring so much money into Arizona, into the dams in Arizona during the Depression. 
But he actually gave a number of interviews and talked a lot about how he came to Arizona when everybody did it on their own. They didn't need welfare, didn't need no welfare state. I'm sorry, I made that up. That was later. But, um, but they didn't, you know, nobody protected their water, nobody protected their labor, and he, he very deliberately did that. And he was a very handsome man, and he shows up in life early on in the white cowboy hat, and he becomes known as a, as a cowboy. Let's, let's uh, stay with economics for a minute. <laughs> and uh, how it relates so to So it is like my comps. What? I said, it is like my comprehensive exams. Your comprehensive I, exams? I, I, I guess you were looking and I said, I felt like we were getting ready for my comprehensive exams. And then you were asking all sorts of questions and now I just gave a, a pretty good answer about culture and you're like, let's talk about economics. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you had just mentioned socialism. Um, just trying to cover all the bases here. You, you, you are an economic scholar, and you've pointed out that much of white grievance, and those are my words, is a result of the middle class being left out after Reagan. Do you see President Biden's economic policies as a source of healing? This polarization, hopefully, uh, wealth gets uh, more widely shared? So, so this is a really important point because what happened in 1980, of course, was that Ronald Reagan is elected by 50.1% of the vote. And he argued that if you got rid of government regulation and taxation, what it would do is it would concentrate wealth at the top of the economic scale. And those people would in turn invest in new, econ uh, new uh, industries quite efficiently because they were working with the markets and those uh, industries would grow and hire more people and all boats would rise together. And many of you may remember that, the idea that, the, that a, a rising tide lifts all boats, right? Is that right? A rising tide lifts all boats. But in fact, what happened was uh, wealth concentrated to the top. If you look at any graph about any kind of economic scale from 1981, you can see money moving to the top. And what that did is it hollowed out the middle class. So taxes, in fact, never really went down. What happened was that who paid the taxes changed. And the, the economic growth that that system was supposed to, 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 uh, to goose, if you will, never materialized. So what Biden has done, and what that did is it created this very disaffected group of people who are, you know, felt that they, you know, you had to work two jobs, you no longer had cultural capital, you no longer necessarily had religious capital, and you certainly didn't have actually in the bank capital. And authoritarians will tell you, or the people who study authoritarianism will tell you that that population is ripe for a strong man to come in and say, I can take you back to when you used to be important. And I can do it not by actually fixing anything, but by putting in place a series of universal religious laws or traditional laws that will take us back to that magic place. Now, I will emphasize when I say that, that when Donald Trump spoke in 2015 and 16 when he was running for the presidency, he was the most moderate economic candidate on the Republican stage. People forget that because they focus on the racism and the sexism. But he called for cheaper and better health care. He called for um, infrastructure. That's why the infrastructure thing kept coming up again and again. He said there was going to be infrastructure. He called for bringing back manufacturing. He called for closing loopholes so that rich people paid more taxes. We've all forgotten that, but he was referring to those economic grievances of that specific group. So one of the things that Biden has done is he has tried, no, he hasn't tried. He has stopped that 40-year period in which we focused on markets as being the solution to constructing society and has, in fact, gone back to the early period under which we lived from 1933 to 1981 in which Americans as a group, no matter what party you belong to, agreed that the government had a role to play in regulating business, providing a basic social safety net, promoting infrastructure, and protecting civil rights. And he's been really articulate about this. This is not a mystery. One of the things that he has done, though, that's different than, for example, FDR or Teddy Roosevelt or Abraham Lincoln, who tried to do very similar things, is that rather than centering heteronormative 
uh, nuclear families trying to make sure men had the ability to support their wives and children, which is quite literally what FDR talks about. Biden tried to center children, which is a whole new kettle of fish, because if you center children, who their parents are matters a lot less. And he's not been able to do that, but he articulated that early on. But he has very much tried to do that, and he's tried to do it in what they keep calling a whole of government way, which has gotten almost no attention in the press, although they're not shy about it. Believe me, the Biden administration tells you what's going on on a pretty constant basis. But they, what that means is that they have asked every possible agency or department that is involved in something to get involved in it. So, for example, on um, the 26th of September, I think it was. Now it's going to bother me. Um, because it was the anniversary of the construction, uh, the establishment of the, Fed, uh, the, the uh, Federal Trade Commission. They launched a lawsuit against Amazon, which was a really big deal. And the reason they did that is they are trying to get rid of a system that was put in place during the 1980s by Robert Bork, that Robert Bork, who said that it was OK if um, companies all combined so long as it meant that, work, that, that consumers got lower prices in the short term. So you didn't need to have competition any longer. You didn't have to have people who could uh, strike for higher wages. You didn't have to have any of the uh, ability for entrepreneurs, for example, to break into a market, which one can't do against Amazon when it controls 40% of the market. All of that was fine, so long as in the short term, consumers got lower prices. Well, the Biden administration has worked very hard to go back before that to the traditional meaning of antitrust from the early 20th century that says it is a value to our community to have workers be able to have higher wages. It is a value to our community to be able to have competition because it creates innovation and it creates lower prices and it means that there's an openings for new uh, new businesses to start. It's a value to the community to have a much more vibrant economy rather than simply focusing on short-term lower prices. So they've done that. I just outlined uh, the antitrust stuff. But they've done that for wages. They've done that. One of the things when we talk about the, the increasing wages and how wages have increased a lot faster than they, than they have over inflation, where that's especially true is in people who made less than $20,000 a year. So what that means is that in, in a brief period of time, many of those laws have now ended because the pandemic, uh, the extreme uh, uh, ways that people were trying to fix the pandemic, many of those have expired now. But in two years, they wiped out 25% of the inequality that had built up over the past 40 years. Now, that's rising again, but he worked very hard to do that. And he worked to do that, I think, because he cares about the economic side of it. But I will point out, which he's never talked about, but as a historian, I will, when we have what is known as compression between wages, I'm sorry, between income and wealth, which are two separate things. So the people at the bottom don't have that much of a gap between them and people at the top. So for example, in the 1950s, the difference between a Ford worker and the Ford CEO was about eight times. The, the worker, made, the guy at the top made about eight times what the person at the bottom does. Now it's more than 350 times. And when we have those periods of compression, people tend to be much more willing to open up society to, uh, to people from different races, different ethnicities, different genders, because there is this sense that if you can feed your own kids, you're perfectly happy to let somebody else feed their own kids. But if you can't feed your own children, you start to blame that guy next to you. And so I think Biden has really worked to do that. Um, it's not getting a lot of attention, which is sort of astonishing. This, this administration has been, um, one of the most transformational, transformational presidencies in history. And I will say I did not expect that. Um, I, I did not expect that. I won't say any more than that. But the fact that this transformational president has gotten so little attention for that is really sort of mind boggling. Yeah. Mm. I got that. It was September 26. Can I have a gold star for that? Can I pass my comps? Yeah. I mean, your fans are helping you write, talk, even talk. So, 
you, you know, you interviewed Joe Biden in the White House one-on-one. -on -one. It's a beautiful picture. It's on YouTube. I love the, uh, the fireplace in the background. What, what did you learn about Joe Biden? So first of all, um, that's a very small room. The rooms in the White House are very small, which, so the funny thing about that is doesn't it look like we're like friends having tea? We were like this with the fireplace there and the rest of the room starting like here was packed with people just packed with people. So you're trying to look casual and there's all these people like <laughs> <laughs> And it's a little hard not to be aware that there are like secret service people with big guns and, and so it was not what one would call a calm, relaxing chat on my part anyway. You look, you look very calm though. Well, that's because I'm a teacher and teachers do that. We look like we know what we're doing, right? Do we have teachers here? Like, you know, like, like you say to the students, well, yes, this is the way it's done. And you're thinking, shit, I don't remember that. Like, um, <laughs> but I didn't know what to be prepared for at all. And, and I, I really didn't. But I did a lot of homework on him um, because I didn't want to ask the usual questions. First of all, I knew he wasn't going to tell me anything that wasn't public knowledge. And, so, and this is one of the things that makes me sort of bonkers about the press pool, is they're always shouting at him to tell them something, or to John Kirby or somebody, to tell them something secret. And it's like, they're not going to tell you anything that isn't public information. But here's a news flash. There's public information in all kinds of places. You people don't bother to look. So if you really are trying to use your time well, you might want to like take a little hop and skip over there to the Defense Department, which has just put down all this information that nobody's reporting on. So I, didn't, I knew he wasn't going to tell me anything that, that was unknown. And I didn't want to ask things that other people would obviously ask. So I did a lot of homework on him and his relationships in, for example, the Judiciary Committee and the, uh, the Senate, the Senate um, Foreign Relations Committee, which is, you know, we, he is the most skilled president in foreign affairs since at least Eisenhower. And that's saying something. I mean, it's really astonishing. But, you know, one of the things that, that became clear is he'd managed to talk Strom Thurmond around on a bunch of things. And I'm like, really, Strom? And you? So I asked him a bunch of questions that were all over the map. And I didn't know what he was going to say or what he was going to do. But he was incredibly sharp, incredibly on top of it, incredibly loquacious, I have to say. Um, but... It just amused me to know, and very calm and very much in command of the room, of the conversation. And, um, and I, I left, and he loves what he does. He loves serving people. And after that, he did, in fact, take me to show me the, he told me stories in the Roosevelt Room, and he showed me the, you know, the different rooms up above, and he gave me a chocolate chip cookies. And, um, <laughs> But he clearly is a man made for service. And anytime anybody says he's doddering, I'm like, if I had half that man's brain power, and I'm significantly younger than him, I, I, I left, I, I went because why not, right? But I left um, really impressed, really impressed uh, across the board. And, and somewhat shell-shocked, to be honest. You know, that's not what one expects to do on a, on a Friday afternoon, but. What is your advice for President Biden in a second term? Oh, you asked me that earlier. Uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that, except to say that it has been my impression that he has moved as a man who has nothing to lose. So if you're a legislator who's 40, you might want to have a long career or even a legislator who's 60 or even 70, you might want to have a future in whatever way. And I feel like at his age, he just is laying it all in the field. 
in a way that reminds me, and I'm not trying to make an explicit connection here, but that reminds me of Lincoln, because Lincoln laid it all on the field, too. And I'm not, I'm not trying to say, please don't go quote me in some newspaper saying, she said Biden was like Abraham Lincoln. I don't mean that in terms of, in many ways, but he's laying it all on the field right now. So we have these extraordinary laws that are reshaping our American domestic policy. Um, I think in a second term, he would try and push for that second half of Build Back Better that did center children and that did center caregivers, because that's a freaking no-brainer as far as I'm concerned. And the fact it couldn't get through this, the, the Congress is in reflective, I think, of who's in the Congress, because anybody who has been a primary caregiver for a child or an elderly person recognizes that our system in the United States is freaking miserable and that we would be a much more effective economy if we did not, in fact, have to pay our full salaries to the child care provider or didn't have to drop everything to take care of our elderly father. Um, plus, it would pump money into rural areas that where every people, everybody needs caregivers. So it would, if you actually did that and pump money into rural areas, you don't have to build a plant. You don't have to retrain people. You simply would be providing money to those areas that are having trouble right now. I think that was a really good idea. But so I think I would push that, but I think he's really transformed the United States. I think he would push that. But then I think he's also made a number of really, really important revisions to United States international affairs. So democracy has always had a really important, I think, intellectual problem in that if you believe that people should have the right to self-determination, how can you spread that to other people? Because by definition, then, you're destroying their ability to have their own self-determination. So democracy has always come, really, since 19, um, I'm sorry, 1898 with a healthy dose of colonialism. But at the same time, you don't want to be isolationist. So what do you do about that? And it is my impression that what he and his people are doing, and Blinken, by the way, appears never to sleep, and he's a very smart man. Um, uh, they appear to be trying to institute a policy of regionalism around the world, which is the idea that regions should be responsible for themselves with all the stakeholders having a seat at the table. And you see this really dramatically in the Indo-Pacific, for example, where he has really worked to build up other states around China. And the United States media portrays that as Biden fighting China, taking on China. And I actually think if you look at the speeches and what they are doing, for example, trying to get Apple to move into Vietnam, is to try and support those other states so that they can have a seat at the table. Similarly, of course, it was Biden's push that really helped to get the African Union get a seat at the G20, which is now the G21. I assume that they're going to add the one on there as of the last meeting, because the African Union, which did not have a seat at the G20, now has a seat at the G20. We also have in Latin America, of course, a number of immigration centers in the countries themselves from which immigrants are coming so that they have to, to talk, they have to, to deal there with people trying to get asylum. So there's now a rule that you have to apply for asylum through each country you pass. And that's not necessarily to expect people to get it there, but for those regions to recognize that it is everybody's problem, not just a US versus Nicaragua or whatever problem. And that idea of trying to institute self-determination through regionalism, I don't know if it's going to work or not, but it certainly seems to me to open a way to answer the problem of global wars if you're answer if you're if you're focusing on the regions first and of dealing with the problem of colonialism and I don't know how it's going to come out. You know, I write about it all the time, and people are like, oh, this is brilliant. I'm like, I don't know if it's brilliant or not, because it's not really my field, but it's new, and it certainly has great potential. So I guess I would say to him, get us some elder care and child care, and then keep on doing what you're doing. I only have time for two more questions. Um, how did you discover your talent? Was there a crossroads or a special moment where you realized, hey, I can make a life out of this? Oh my God, you know, I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> um, I have been so fortunate 
in, um, in the people who trained me and where I grew up. I grew up with storytellers and, and I, I, you know, I just, I, I, I don't think I ever discovered anything. I think I just was incredibly fortunate. How I got into doing the letters, though, I, I told you the story, I think, didn't I? Maybe I, t I don't remember who I told it to. Not yet. Um, I got, I started doing the letters. I mean, I was a, I am, not I was, I am an academic historian and a, you know, a decently regarded one, actually, but that one nobody really talks about that much anymore. Um, <laughs> but, but, and I'm going to write another academic book someday, just so you know. Um, but I started writing the letters because I w had been writing on Facebook um, an essay about once a week. And something happened in September of 2019 that meant that I hadn't written for a long time. And I got, um, I, I was moving house and all, and writing a book and all that. And then I got stung by a yellow jacket on September 15th and thought I would write on Facebook for all the people who'd been following me because they were worried about me because I'd been on the professor watch list and stuff and they were worried about my safety. And I wrote this essay about what America looked like to me that day. And, and people started writing back and saying, wait a minute, can you explain that? Tell me more about that. And I thought, well, well I'm not gonna flood the zone by writing two nights in a row. So I waited until the 17th and I started answering questions. And I've written every night since. And one of the things that you talk about discovering my talent, people taught me to write. And, and sitting and writing, I've written well over a million, maybe over two million words now. That makes you a good writer. It's my, I call it my Beatles in Germany moment. But, um, but what really has been going on is a conversation between you all, all over the world, all over the country and all over the world, and me sitting in what is literally a storage room that overlooks the compost heap in the back of my house, talking about the world and insisting, first of all, on living in a reality-based community. Because what we are doing is we are insisting on the principles of the enlightenment on which this country was founded. That if we have access to reality, we can make arguments about how to do better. And we will choose the right thing if only we insist on living in reality. And what I try and demonstrate every night is not an opinion. Often people mistake what I'm writing for opinion. I'm trying to write what happened so that we all understand the feet, our feet under us. So partly it's a conversation about the enlightenment and about reality, but it's also a conversation about democracy. And the questions that people ask and the comments they make and the criticisms they make have enabled us, I think, to have a conversation between me and all of you people where I basically take the notes and you're all talking to each other and recognizing that democracy is not a spectator sport and that everybody has a role to play and that together we really can redefine this nation and take it back from those people who are trying to impose minority political rule on a majority. So that is really all that I do. And I'm getting pretty good at the grammar and stuff because I do it so much. But what this really is, is a joint effort. And one of the things that I think it's really important for you all to know is that I don't get a lot of sleep. You know that. But the reason for that is because I feel like the luckiest person on earth to be part of this movement and to be part of this conversation and to be the person who gets to keep this record in this moment for the United States of America. And for a historian, there is literally nothing in the universe that would be a better use of my time and that would make me happier. And I never, ever, ever forget that I have the opportunity to do that because of you all. So I thank you for doing that for me, but also for the country. So how did I learn I had a skill? I never really learned I had a skill. We all are learning that we have a skill together, 
and it's really an exciting place to be. You, you wanted to leave us with a message of hope, so I'll just give you the floor and you can finish. Well, well people ask me why I have hope, and, and my answer to that is that I have faith in us. I mean, I think that's probably clear from what I just said. I have faith in American democracy because we have been in bad times before, and we have managed to come through them by talking to each other, by insisting on reality, by spreading the message that democracy matters, that being treated equally before the law matters, that having a right to a say in your government matters. But I also have faith in us because I believe that we are part of the human project of cementing human self-determination, that people have the right to determine their own futures. And I don't believe at the end of the day that Americans will give that up for the likes of the people who are currently trying to impose their will on the rest of us. So I know things look frightening. They look frightening to me too. But do you really think at the end of the day the genie of American democracy is going to be stuffed into a bottle and corked for generations to come? I think the answer to that can only be no. <clears throat> Professor Richardson, thanks for a beautiful evening. We like to give clocks because uh, we're progressives and we like to say it's our time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. This is great. You know I'm always late to everything. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks again for joining us, and please consider a donation and get your copy of Democracy Awakening at the links. Until next time, take care. <laughs>